Well, good morning. As we uh, begin, I want to say uh, welcome to you and welcome to those who are joining online. Uh, today is the final sermon of the Awakening series. I kind of want to let you know where we're headed in the, in the future. Next week, we're going to begin a new series called Practicing Christian. It's based off of some research that uh, over last year has been done with uh, Gallup. It says 63% of Americans identify themselves <coughs> as followers of Jesus. So um, the question we need to ask ourselves is, what does that actually mean? What does it mean to be a quote-unquote practicing Christian? That's what our focus is going to be over this fall. And particularly if, there's, if you're not in a group, I really encourage you uh, in one of the groups that are going to be starting up as a companion study to this. But today we finish this series with the, uh, the question of, what do we do with some of the things that we've learned? I, I heard a story this week by... Uh, Jim Harbaugh, some of you might recognize that name. Jim Harbaugh is the, it was the uh, Michigan State head coach. He is now the head coach of the uh, Los Angeles Chargers. And in this interview, um, he told a story that I thought, man, that, that'll preach. I need to tell you this story. Uh, it, it was uh, when he was growing up, his dad was a coach, and he was also an educator at a college. And so he was uh, coaching, and part of the, the coach deal was that you would get deals from car dealerships. And uh, one particular morning, he went out um, and there was no car there. Uh, so apparently the car dealer had taken the car and so they're just stuck. And so uh, Jim's dad is there as long as his brother John. And they had to travel about a mile. So he said, hey boys, uh, grab a basketball. And they each grabbed the basketball. We, there's no car, we're gonna walk. We're going to walk. And they start walking. They're practicing their dribbling skills. And he tells them in this uh, little interaction, he says, he tells them this little mantra. He says, who has it better than we do? And they say, nobody. Who has it better than we do? Nobody. And in the interview, what he was saying was that what he's really trying to communicate, to his dad was trying to say, you need to see things in a different perspective. You might see yourself as a no car, but, man, we've been so blessed. And also, we've been blessed with our family. And I thought, man, that'll preach. Who has it better than we do? Nobody. That's what we've been studying over the past several weeks with this whole idea of awakening. The fact that there is a God who created us, didn't need to create us, but he created us out of the overflow of his love. He created us to know him, to walk with him. And we as human beings, and we chose to go our own way, who can believe this God? He chose to, by his grace, send Jesus Christ to enter in on our behalf, to, to reconcile us to God by his death on the cross, uh, by the blood that he shed for us. Allow his righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus, to become our righteousness so that when God sees us, he sees us as holy and, and he loves us. And we become children of God. And the same spirit which raised Jesus from the dead gets to live within us. And we have this power over sin that sin doesn't have to have the last word. That sin doesn't have to rule our lives. That we instead can be freed from the guilt and the power of sin in our lives. And we can live with freedom. That is good news. Amen? That is what we proclaim. Who is it better than us? Nobody. Man, that's great. But the challenge with that is, what do you do with that? What do you do with that? Sometimes people can come on a little strong with their good news, right? I remember uh, growing up, there was a, uh, in college, when my face started to come alive, I'd go home sometimes on the weekends, and sometimes we get the knock on the door on like a Saturday morning, and there was a particular faith group that would like to visit our neighborhood and our street. And sometimes you could do things to be like, uh, yeah, we're not interested in anything that you're selling. You know, we could just tell them to leave. Or you can have a conversation. And I enjoyed having conversations with these people, right? So, but sometimes what, the way they came across was a little bit like, hey, we know the truth, and if you just become like us, you're going to be okay, right? That didn't really go, didn't feel really good, right? And sometimes we as Christians, we can come across that way sometimes. We have this hope that Christ has put in our lives. So what do we do with that? Do we come... Do we come with a sense of you need to become like us in order to, to uh, have God's favor upon your life? How do you share this good news of what God is doing in your life? 
that's what we're looking at today. And we're looking at, uh, this is, you know, really important, I, sh- I want to say this too, this is really important in the culture that we live that is in many ways hostile to uh, or not interested in, the, in the, uh, the message that we proclaim. So how we share the gospel or share what God's doing in our life is really important that we get it right. So I want to look at it uh, through the lens of this really old story, uh, old account, I should say, in Isaiah chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to open to Isaiah chapter 6, pretty much right in the middle of the Bible. And as always, you can access the sermon notes on the Version app. So I want to give you a, a little context to when this was written and the accounts of this. This is about 20, the events of this are about 2,700 years ago when Isaiah was um, a prophet, lived in the, the nation of Judah, the southern kingdom. His, uh, the nation had split, and uh, he lived in Jerusalem. And at that point, the uh, king was King Uzziah. King Uzziah became king when he was 16 years old. Could you imagine becoming king when you're 16 years old? And he reigned for 52 years. That's a long time. And during his reign, there was a lot of good things. There's a lot of economic prosperity. The nation, uh, for the most part, followed God. But there's, as you read in some other texts, you'll read that King Uzziah got proud. He was uh, happy with himself, and he felt like uh, he had certain privileges being king. And so as a result, he actually engaged in some things that kings should not engage with. One of the things was to burn incense at the temple. Now, you might think, what's the big deal about burning incense? But there were specific regulations at the, the temple where the, the meeting place of God is only certain people are to do that. Those are the Levites. That's their job. And so um, as a result of that, he ignores the warnings. He doesn't listen to the temple priests. And he decides to light some incense to God. God has some consequences that come to him. And in fact, the scripture tells that he actually contracted leprosy beginning on his head on the spot. And so he, they actually have to remove him. He's, they have to cleanse the temple. He's essentially uh, on his own and he lives in isolation the rest of his life. So the account of this time is right after King Uzziah died. So imagine if you had uh, had a king that reigned for 52 years, who did all sorts of good things, sure, ended on a bad note, but there was a lot of good things that he did during his reign. And that comes in the the, the context of this passage. So let's look at it. Isaiah uh, chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, Seated on the throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. It's interesting, the cause and effect. As uh, in the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Sometimes it's like that in life. There are certain idols or people who we might value, who might, might be really good. But at the same time, sometimes when they go away, you see things in a different light. Maybe it's a job, you lose a job, or an important person in your life dies, or maybe you get divorced, or maybe you have a possession that you lose, and all of a sudden, you're like looking for something, and that's what happened here. When King Uzziah died, he got to see the Lord, and notice how he sees him, high and exalted. The description is other than, seated on the throne, and the train of his robe filled with temple. You get this image of you're just barely seeing the feet of God. I mean, that's how huge God is. God is completely other than. In verse 2, above him were seraphim, which were like heavenly angels, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, uh, they covered their feet. And two, with two that they were flying. Why did they cover themselves? We find out in the next verse. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Why does it say holy, holy, holy? It's just trying to repeat itself. I mean, I mean, making sure you get the message. It's the complete holiness of God. That God is totally other than anything that we can experience. And this was by a heavenly, heavenly creatures, the seraphim. 
who are describing God that way. Soren Kierkegaard, the great philosopher, he said, there's an infinite qualitative difference between us and God. He says at verse 4, at the sound of their voices, <clears throat> the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. I mean, that is like all the smells and the bells, like the holiness of God, but your, your feet actually trembled. You see, feel the sense of smoke. And then verse 5, Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. See, that happens when, when you see God and how he truly is beyond comprehension in his majesty, in his power, in his might, and in his love. You, you see who you really are. It's kind of like when you go to the dentist. You ever been to the dentist where they shine the light on your teeth? You think your teeth are white, but then they shine that special light and you're like, ah, oh, yikes. That's the way it is when we're in the presence of a holy God. Man, you can see all the imperfections. And the only appropriate response is, what was me? God, God I, I need help. I, I'm not good enough for you. But then what happens next is verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he has taken with the tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and he said, see, this has touched your lips and your guilt is taken away and your sin atone for. The seraphim uh, takes away the guilt and the sin that Isaiah had by this cleansing that he offers. Then verse 8, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? It's interesting. I wonder what happened between verses 7 and 8. How did Isaiah change? He sees this holy God. He realizes how he falls short. God in his mercy extends healing to him and he is cleansed. And then he hears the voice of God. Who will I send? Who will go for us? Notice we see the Trinity at work there. And, he, and I said, here I am. Send me. In other words, Hey, count me in. I'm in. I'll go. Now, if you've been in the church for a while, you've maybe heard this text and you've heard this text preach like we, need to, we are gone, we are called to go and we're sent by God. But I don't know about you, but sometimes in my life, I raise my hand and say, count me in. And then I put my hand down sometimes and I say, yeah, I'm not sure. You know, maybe it's going to cost me more than I am aware of. And sometimes I struggle with that. And maybe sometimes you struggle with that too. But that's what Isaiah is saying is, I'm all in, God. I'm all in. A few years ago, there was a, uh, a man who was on a trip to uh, China. And so they were in two large uh, travel buses. And as they're uh, driving in China, he's in the second bus, and it snows, and apparently in the story, the, uh, the first bus kind of slipped while they were making a turn, and it flipped over into a rice paddy, and it falls over. The second bus stops. The man jumps out of the second bus, and he jumps on the first bus, and when he jumps on the first bus, he sees this emergency door. There are broken windows, but the better strategy is open the emergency door. And so he turns the handle and he's pulling with all of his might and it's not budging. And so he decides, I'm going to try to, well, at least I'll try to get these open windows. And he pulls, starts pulling people out. And then he sees this other guy jump on as well and op he turns the handle and opens the door right up. And then he realizes what his problem was. The reason the, the door didn't open was simply because he was standing on it. He was standing on the door. 
Sometimes we can be the, our own obstacles for how God wants to use us. So we don't want to be an obstacle. So if you're a person who says, man, God's been working in my life. I'm excited what God's doing in my life. I want to share that to others. Here I am, God. How do we do that? How do we do that? How can I go and not be an obstacle to somebody? I want to share with you a couple of thoughts on, on how do we go? Uh, how do we share this good news? The first is simply this. Engage in spiritual conversations with what? Humility. With humility. Not the experience that you, or at least I had, when somebody's knocking on my door with a sense of, you need to change. That didn't go over very well. You go with a sense of humility. And you engage in conversation. A few uh, weeks ago, maybe a month ago, our, our youth director, Michelle Garcia, had this idea that uh, in, uh, where we're building the Habitat House in Lenore City, um, you know, which should be done this fall, uh, hopefully. Um, what about that, that street? And so she got in her mind, what if we delivered like Italian dinners and we blessed the people on the street who lived in the houses along this neighborhood? And so last Sunday night, um, there was 10 youth and uh, some adults who went to door by door to deliver these Italian meals. It was a picture that somebody took, uh, just door by door. And all we simply did was, hey, we're part of that group that's one of the churches that's building that house down the road. Um, and uh, we just want to bless your house with an Italian dinner night. And... Um, See if there's anything we can pray for you about. And it was interesting. We had some interesting conversations. Some people uh, really were interested to talk uh, and pray, and some people weren't. Some people were like, well, hey, maybe I, we're good. Maybe this next house could use it. Um, but it's this whole idea of not trying to convert somebody necessarily. It's just engaging in a conversation. Um, we're just the, the, some of those people who are part of that house. So as you share uh, at work, as God provides you opportunities with customers or at work or with your neighborhood or at school, um, take advantage of the opportunities. Don't try to necessarily convert somebody to your way of thinking, but engage in a spiritual conversation. Nobody can argue with a testimony that God has put in your life or what God's doing in your life. Second one is just simply celebrate your personal inadequacy. That seems a little challenging. Let's say that out loud. Celebrate your personal inadequacy. Most of us don't want to do that, right? We want to hide our personal inadequacy. Um, I actually was going to share something different, but I, I was watching the news on Friday night, and I saw this story. Maybe you heard it, um, but it, it just told the story really well. There's a guy by the name of Dave. Dave. Um, Dave was a guy that, uh, or is a guy, he still is a guy, he hasn't changed. Uh, he is a guy, um, but he became famous, he lives in Mississippi. He became, or maybe I should say infamous, because five years ago, um, he dressed up in this costume here, uh, Captain America. And he was in the backyard of some people and was robbing their shed. And he got arrested. He was trying to find money or to sell things. He got arrested. And uh, it, the news stories went viral about him. And the interesting thing about that is he had, uh, obviously he's humiliated. I mean, why would you do that? But he sees, a, a guy sees the news reports and he recognizes him. He was his friend. And he realized no sane person would do that. He must be you know, have some sort of um, perhaps a drug issue. So he reaches out to the guy and um, he in invites him to, he runs a, a rehab place. He enters, invites him to be a part of that and um, he gets clean. And uh, afterwards, he starts working for this organization. Here's a picture of him. Uh, five years later, telling his story regularly about how embarrassed he was for the choices that he made but how he got clean, how he realized a power greater than, greater than himself brought him to clarity. 
an opportunity to celebrate his personal inadequacy. Now, most of us wouldn't want a picture of us on the screen about the things that we're embarrassed about. But why does God seem to work powerfully when people simply share their story? Not share what they're great at, but instead maybe share what they're not so great at. Or maybe the things that I'd rather hide and not tell anybody about. The type of church that I'd say Jesus wants to create is a, is a church that doesn't go top down, but instead goes bottom up. Paul said it this way, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. But what Dave had to do and what we have to, to do is not just celebrate our personal inadequacy. We have to simply say, here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. Offer yourself to God. There's a lot of things that the world needs. But one of the things the world needs to see is hope. And the way they see that hope is a transformed life. Or maybe I should say it this way. A life that is being transformed by the grace of God. What brings us together is that we all need God in our life. And so I want to give you an invitation today, simply as we end this series, just to say, I, I want to be available. I want to be available however God would use me. About six months ago, I'm going to invite the band to come up. About six months ago, um, I heard a song that I hadn't heard before. We're going to end the service with this. Um, one of the verses starts off this way. If it's bandaging the broken or washing filthy, filthy feet, here I am, Lord, send me. If it's loving one another, even when we don't agree, here I am, Lord, send me. That line is repeated all throughout the song. And then the chorus says this, if, I know, if I'm known by how I love, then let my life reflect how much I love you. I love you. And before you even ask, I love this, my answer will be yes. Because I love you. I love you. That's the kind of person that I want to become more like. And maybe you want to become that too. So we're going to sing that together. And when that line comes up, I invite you to sing, sing that. But I just invite you to uh, make an altar where you are and just offer yourself to God. Maybe there's somebody on your heart that maybe God is calling you to, to step out in faith to make a difference in. Maybe you want to pray for that person during the song. Maybe you just want to say, here I am, Lord, send me. As always, you can come to the altar if you'd like to pray. Pastor.